I'm David Greitzer and welcome to Quick Takes. Today we're meeting with Dr. John Torres, who is Director of Digital Psychiatry at a Harvard-affiliated hospital. Uh, he is also a practicing psychiatrist. Welcome, Doctor. Thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure. Let's talk about how psychiatry is changing. Let's start with a really quick question. What is digital psychiatry? So I think digital psychiatry is a pretty broad umbrella term, but in some ways you can break it up into two parts. One are new ways that we can quantify the lived experience of patients through mobile and digital devices like smartphones and smartwatches. The second part is new ways we can push digital interventions that can increase access to care, give people access to apps or tools or support from their phones or computers or mobile devices. What, what are developments you're seeing now that are particularly exciting? So I think we're seeing a lot of interesting things on the phenotyping side, we'll call it the characterizing the lived experience side, as well as the intervention side, delivering care to people remotely. What we're seeing on the phenotyping side is because increasingly people have access to smartphones, not everyone, we're able to, with people's permission, capture a lot of data about how people kind of experience mental illness, what are their symptoms in real time, what does their sleep look like, what is their physical activity. We can even say, how does sleep impact physical activity? How does it impact mood? We can kind of begin to understand the functional outcomes beyond just asking, how are you feeling? It's, let's look at kind of what's causing you to feel that way. Let's go one step deeper. Let, let's explore that for, for, for a couple of minutes. I, I mean, for most of us, when we're treating a patient, we're highly dependent on what the patient tells us, right? So the way I tell if my patient's been sleeping is I ask, have you been sleeping? And some of my patients might even have sleep logs. But with smartphones and wearables, that could change. That could change. So I said, I still too ask my patients, how are you sleeping? What's the quality of your sleep? But it's interesting then to say, and here's a, what your phone perhaps is recording, your sleep automatically, nothing you were doing extra. We're saying, does this make sense? Does this match up with your experience? And again, sensors aren't always right. I think we all have cases where digital data looks different, but sometimes that can spark a very interesting conversation where someone says, well, it looks like the phone says I'm sleeping this long, but I'm really in bed with insomnia, not able to, to fall asleep. Or sometimes people say, oh, maybe I do actually fall asleep at 2 a.m. and not really 10 p.m. like I think I do. So this is, these are early days, but a couple of years ago, you wrote a paper about the potential of smartphones and, and how much data we could gather. So running through what we potentially could get. You can imagine that with permission, the key word, we could get GPS pings and learn about people's mobility throughout the day, throughout the week. Are they spending more time at home? Are they going far? Are they going to different places? The accelerometer built into phone, we can learn are people running? Are they walking? Are they sedentary? Are they chasing after buses? With microphone, we can learn about tone of voice. We can learn about are we noticing that people, their voice is becoming perhaps more depressed? from its features. Let's talk about a few things going on and, and quickly tell me your thought uh, as to whether or not you think this is going to change healthcare. Virtual reality. Not this year, not next year, maybe in four to five years. And how would that influence the way I treat my patients? I think, right, we're going to see that this will be very good for anxiety, for exposure therapies. It's going to become more affordable, more accessible. E-therapies. I think E-therapies can be very effective if people can get through them. We're going to learn more about what type of human support, what type of, is it coaches, auxiliary providers, what type of clinician support makes people actually get through e-therapy to get the benefit. Chatbots. Chatbots, exciting potential. If you've ever used one of them for more than a couple minutes, the limitations become pretty clear. That said, tremendous advances in natural language processing always happening in machine learning. I think we're going to hopefully see some more big pivotal studies later this year or perhaps in one to two years, but too early to tell. My patients, like yours, often come to my office and ask about apps. Sometimes they swear by apps they're using. Sometimes they ask for app recommendations. What are your thoughts? So it's a question I think that if your patients aren't asking you about apps, they may actually be using it and a little bit embarrassed to ask you. It's almost like when Google first came out and people didn't want to say, 
hey, I Googled my symptoms, I think I have cancer. And I think in that way, I think because mental health apps are so accessible, I was in New York City recently, there were bus billboards telling me to download mental health apps. If you're on Facebook, you'll get Facebook banner ads saying to download mental health apps. So people are being exposed to them, whether you may realize it or not. This actually became such an issue of patients we had and other people were having it that we approached American Psychiatric Association and of other psychiatrists like Stephen Chan in San Francisco, we formed a work group that does app evaluation with the American Psychiatric Association. And what we came up with is a model, if you Google APA app evaluation model, you'll come to the page, and there'll be some improvements in later 2019. But we said we're going to have a four-stage model. Think of a pyramid shape if you're listening online. And we said the first thing when someone brings you an app is to say, let's talk about the privacy and safety. And we put up some questions like, is there a privacy policy? Some things to guide informed decision making. And we said, if privacy and safety make sense, go on to level two, what is the evidence? And as we alluded to, a lot of these apps may have anecdotal evidence, but no one's peer reviewing what goes on to iTunes and Android store. A patient may find something that says it's great for depression. You look at the content and you go, oh my gosh, this is just wrong. There's a case example of Jennifer Nicholas, a researcher now in Chicago at CBITS, found a bipolar app that told people to drink hard alcohol when they were manic. So there are actually apps that just have dangerous content out there. There's also apps that are just, they say they're based on CBT and you look at them and you'll go, this is based on someone's opinion of something, which is fine, but that's not CBT. So you almost want to look at the evidence. And the third layer is you want to say, is it usable? We talked about the case where just because it's an app doesn't mean it's sticky. What is the plan that a patient's going to use it? And the fourth layer, we said, what is the data integration? By that we mean, you don't want to fragment care. You don't want to have a patient of their meds are in one app, their physical activity is in a different app, CBT is in a different app. All that data doesn't come back to their provider, to their clinician to kind of say, what are the big trends? So we said, we can't tell you what the best app is because apps keep changing. If you look at your phone right now, how many want to update? Imagine if we tried to again tell you these are the top five mental health apps. By the time we had that list, they'd all have updated, they'd be different. Right. So unlike a medication where the, it's always going to be that, CBT, it's always manualized. These apps change, and because the research is so new, we don't have a gold standard app to compare to. I can't tell you this is really, I can't even tell you today what is the effect size we should expect from an app for depression, because the research, every couple months, a new paper comes out that tells us. So I think it's tempting to kind of go to these app repositories or these websites that say, here's apps and we rank them on our custom scoring system. Right. But at the end of the day, that's not reliable, it's not valid. You're giving your patients inaccurate information. Do, do you recommend apps? So I do recommend apps to patients. And usually what I do, though, is I kind of go through with them. And I say, let's have a discussion about it. Let's talk about what the risks and benefits are. Do they make sense for you? Let's talk about the evidence. Let's talk about the usability and let's talk about the interoperability for it. There are some that I've clearly looked at more, so I have some I like, but if a patient brings me a new app, we look at it together. What are some apps you like? Actually, PTSD Coach, the one we talked about, <laughs> the VA, the Veterans Administration in the US, has a very good suite of apps, and because they have privacy policies that really benefit patients, they've done a lot of evidence to show that they work. The usability, they're improving, and we know it's a weakness of some of them. They may not be as engaging. But you can tell patients, I need you to stick with it. You can work around that. And it's very easy to get the data off them. So this suite includes PTSD Coach, CBTI? It includes T2 Mood Tracker, which can help people track symptoms. It has different, um, I think it has a help box one for different, a lot are geared towards veterans and PTSD. But there's a lot of good resources. And again, they cost nothing. There's no hidden costs. There's no subscriptions. I've had a lot of my patients with serious mental illness try to use some of these kind of connect to a therapist app to only be told, well, you have schizophrenia. We don't treat people like you, which is stigmatizing. It's false advertising. And it just really leaves some patients going, why can't I access the same tools that are being advertised? And again, not to replace the psychiatrist or the therapist, but to work with. I mean, is part of the problem here the difference between the agenda of Wall Street and the agenda of doctors like you and me? I think that there's been a lot of interest from startups doing very innovative work, really pushing the boundaries on what technology can do. If, if you ask me, what is the one thing that predicts treatment in various psychotherapies? It's the therapeutic relationship. It's not the modality of treatment. It's, it's the relationship that we as a patient and a clinician have together. 
And I think a lot of times the technology now is almost trying to come sometimes in between a clinician and a patient, not saying how can it bring us closer together. Which brings us to some of the ethical considerations here, like privacy. Certainly in any medical intervention, anything we do, we always think about risks and benefits, right? We always say, what are the risks? What are the benefits? Do they make sense in this case? We don't want to do harm. And I think sometimes in the digital world, what does harm mean in the digital age using these digital tools? It's something that we may not cover in medical school, you may not cover in nursing school, you may not cover in different counseling programs as a psychologist, is that what does data security and privacy mean when someone's using this app? That's not a core topic that we cover. We started teaching it to our residents in Boston because we think it's a very important thing for psychiatrists to be aware of because it's a new type of risk. But really you have to almost say, how do you help a patient understand what data they're giving up? And sometimes that means we as a field have to educate ourselves to say, hey, what is this data? Where is it going? What does it mean that the data is sent, say, outside of Canada? What are the implications for my patient? Will their data ever be deleted? It's complex. How did you get interested in this field? So that's a good question. My background is actually electrical engineering and computer sciences. So it's a slightly different way to approach psychiatry to have an electrical engineer and computer scientist. And I knew that I liked programming, I liked technology, but I really wanted to work with people. So I went to medical school in sunny San Diego. And I actually got interest in psychiatry by learning about ECT and watching how electricity when applied through ECT could really help people depression have very impressive recoveries. Yeah. And I said, this is a kind of, compare it as an electrical engineer, I was kind of designing chips and looking kind of where each electron would go. I said, this is a lot of, ECT is a kind of very early stage of harnessing the neural systems, kind of helping the brain reprogram. And I said, I think there's a lot of interesting ways that technology and electricity could really be used towards improving mental health. When I actually got into residency, I was in Boston doing it. I was initially doing EEG research and using my kind of engineering skills for signal processing, looking for differences in brainwave signals between schizophrenia and bipolar. But I was working in our emergency department, and there was a patient who had come in. He was suicidal, so he was referred to me. But he really didn't want to provide any information about what was going on. Was he safe to discharge? And I asked him with permission, I said, would you permit me to look at your phone so I can see if I can learn something because you don't want to communicate with me? And he said, you can do that. And kind of looking at the text messages was very revealing. Talking about a, a recent paper, American Journal of Psychiatry, there's a paper looking at CBT for substance. It's out of Yale. It's a big journal. And in fact, people who did the computerized cognitive behavioral therapy did better than the Yale psychologist. There's all these exciting studies like this one, again, offer the potential of could we scale therapy, right? Could we offer these programs? And again, some people will not do well in the programs, but some people will. And could they get care when they need, where they want? And again, it'll be interesting as we replicate these studies, see how they work, but these are very, very impactful. In some ways, you could say it could be a sea change in how we're looking at this field. And that doesn't come around very often for many fields. Dr. Torres, we've enjoyed this discussion. Let's turn it over to a minute of rapid fire questions. We've got one minute on the clock. Here we go. Dr. Torres, digital psychiatry. Is this a game changer? Yes. Uh, what excites you the most? New ways to understand lived experience of patients. What causes you to lose sleep at night? ethical concerns used in ways to coerce people or spy on people. What should we be doing differently? Educating trainees about all these digital tools, making sure that we're, the new generation coming up understands that there's risks and benefits in how to evaluate these things. Great patient experience with digital health. Patient actually who came to me and said, the apps you guys are making for research are great, but I've made my own better system and let me show you how it works. We wrote a case report and got that patient as a published author. Jump ahead 10 years, the biggest change we'll see in practice of psychiatry. We're gonna see psychiatrists really learning to actually love, embrace, work with technology, partner with it. This kind of idea of either or is gonna be gone. Quick Takes with CAMH Education is a production of the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. You can find links to the relevant content mentioned in the show, a video version of the episode, and accessible transcripts of all the episodes we produce online at porticonetwork.ca slash podcasts. 
If you like what we're doing here, please subscribe. Until next time.